Hello everyone. Today we're going to be looking at the settings menu inside the Powerbox Core Transmitter. So from the home screen, all we need to do is do a swipe down from this main screen and we can access the settings menu from within the main menu items that are located inside this widget. So from here we can see all the main menus that are in the core transmitter. Uh, this core transmitter is running software application version 3.2 so just keep that in mind. Uh, one other thing with the video is um, if you see any weird patterns inside the icons or on the screen on the display it's actually from my camera and not from the transmitter. Uh, the transmitter screen is perfectly clear uh, but you'll see these uh, what they call moray patterns sometimes. It's just a function of my sampling uh, shutter speed and the CMOS sensor that's inside my uh, Sony camera that I'm using. Anyway, back to the Powerbox Core. So down the bottom you'll see our settings menu. So let's select the settings menu. Once we're inside the settings menu you'll see four options. There's a system option, an appearance option, an audio option and a Wi-Fi option. And I might start with the Wi-Fi option. So obviously in the Wi-Fi option we can um, set up the Powerbox core to communicate to the internet through Powerbox servers and um, it allows us to do software updates of the transmitter but also it allows us to uh, download other applications that are buried within the transmitter as well. Um, the Wi-Fi feature is fairly handy you know, specifically for soft software updates insofar as you don't need to load them onto a card or a USB stick and then from your PC drag them over, it's, it's fairly seamless. So let's have a quick look. Okay, at the moment it's currently switched off. Um, also at the top of the screen you'll see there's a bunch of icons. Uh, one of them is the Wi-Fi indicator, so you'll see a bunch of curved lines and they're the actual relative signal strength. So if you have a weak signal you might only see one or two lines if you have a strong signal, you'll see this full, I think it's four or five, li five lines, uh, curved lines indicating relative signal strength. At the moment, even though it's got five lines, um, you'll see there's a red line through it indicating no Wi-Fi. So those signal strength bar graph or whatever you like to call them indicators don't have any meaning until they go to a green color. So once we're connected, they'll, they'll switch to green. So let's switch it on and let's take a look. Okay, so I've turned it on. It'll, the radio will automatically scan for any Wi-Fi net, networks nearby. And currently I'm located in my garage. Um, all those three um, um, items you can see there are my Wi-Fi um, routers, access points. In my garage I do run an extender, power line extender. And you'll notice in the top two options you'll see EXT in the file name or the menu item and one's labeled 5G for 5 gigs and the other one's 2.4 gigs. So the Powerbox radios will work on a 2.4 gig network or a 5 gig network. Um, we can actually act, select the 5 gig network and you'll notice a new menu's popped up. It's asking us for our network password. Now at the moment you'll see a couple of asterisks in there. And that's because I've already entered my network password for this particular Wi-Fi router. There's a forget option if you want to drop that access point or that router. There's a connect option. So if I click on connect, this will take about 30 seconds or so for it to connect. Once it connects, we'll see this symbol up the top will change to green. And we'll also see an IP address appear in this field. And that's because my um, router will issue an IP address to the radio. There's also two other options towards the bottom right. You'll see portal login and um, password. So these fields are normally left blank when you're connecting locally like I'm doing right now. And the reason being is they're reserved for a future option for Powerbox to set up a cloud server. So once the cloud server set up, you'll be able to type in your unique login and password for that cloud server. And you'll be able to upload and download, say, model files uh, you won't have to store them locally, or if you want to store them locally, you can also save them up to the cloud and download them from the cloud. Currently, that feature is not active, so they're blank. 
I've left them blank. So if you're just locally connecting like I am now, you don't need to fill, you leave those fields blank basically. Okay, so we've connected, so you'll notice there's a valid IP address here. So this is just on my home network. And you'll also notice that the um, bar graph indicator here, or the signal strength indicator, is switched to a green color. So the lines are now green indicating a valid connection. Um, some people have had trouble with their access points or their routers. Um, what I suggest you do, if you do have trouble with the Wi-Fi, it's usually not an issue of the radio, it's usually an issue with the setting inside your access point or your router. A quick way to isolate it is if you have a, a smartphone with an internet connection, is basically set up your smartphone as a Wi-Fi hotspot and use the radio hotspot to, the, to your phone with the radio. So basically enter your login details for your mobile phone and connect through to your phone through the internet and usually that, that works really well. That's handy if you're out in the field and you need to do a software update. Um, I probably wouldn't do that very often. Um, however, the facility's there if you need to use it. Okay, so that's the Wi-Fi in a nutshell. It's a fairly simple layout. Um, again, if you have trouble, access point, use a hotspot on your phone. Um, we haven't had too many people complain of um, when once they're hotspotting to their phone. It, it seems to be 100%. But I do know, you know, routers vary in settings and whatever, and it just takes one network setting to upset the connection. Okay, so let's back out of the Wi-Fi uh, menu. Let's have a look at the audio menu. Audio menu is fairly self-explanatory. We have a slider here for the master volume control. At the moment, it's set to 48%. So this volume setting overrides all these others. So these are a subset of the master. So you notice here, the first item here is the volume trim clicks. So these are for the trimmers, like your aileron elevator trimmers, uh, throttle trimmer on the radio. They can emit a click. And at the moment I've set it to 80%. So that's 80% of the 48% of the master volume. So that'll give us, um, if this was set to 50%, it'll give us half of 48% overall volume. And the same goes for the telemetry alarm. So we have a unique setting for the telemetry alarms. We have a unique setting for the timer alarms and also a unique setting for the VARO if you have a VARO connected. Now you notice these are fixed values, so we can actually have them as a fixed value. You can also set them to a knob or a slider. Um, even the master volume at the moment is set to a slider. However, if we select um, master volume, I now have a fixed setting of 48%. And obviously if we can go in here and uh, change it up and down, or if you want, sometimes people find it convenient if it's on a rotary encoder. So we have two rotary encoders, we have two sliders on the core. Um, basically you can select any input device really, but let's pick a rotary. I'm just using the rotary encoder at the moment. Uh, if I click on OK, if you look at the setting now, um, I can actually change the volume just by moving the rotary knob. So there you have it. If you prefer a rotary knob for your volume for ease of access and you can assign that knob to any of the other um, volume controls as well i tend to use it as a slider only because um, i sort of set and forget for myself um, so i just leave it as a slider okay that's the audio menu done appearance again this is just a customized menu um, it allows us to change all the colors. We can, at the moment, I think on the video, these boxes are coming out of sort of a blue color, but they're actually purple in real life. Um, but of course, we can change the colors. You can go to a yellow box. There's green, there's red. Um, gray's not too bad as well. We can also change the text from white to black. Um, you can even change the background if you like. So you can have an inverse background if you prefer that. Um, well, that one's a bit bit hard to read. I'll go back to black and go back to my purple or what looks like blue in the video. Um, so yeah, so you can you know set that to whatever you prefer. Uh, there's another there's a brightness control in here, but you can select that from the main pull down menu as well for ease of access. There's an automatic uh, dim mode, so at the moment it's set to 10 minutes. So after 10 minutes, the screen will dim. To a certain level 
You can turn that off. We'll have set it to one, two or five minutes as well. There's an auto lock facility. So for those that think that you might touch the screen while you're flying, you can set it to auto lock, say after one minute, two, five or ten. And the only way to unlock the screen once it's locked is by pressing the little fixed lock icon soft key here. There's an idle alarm. That's pretty handy. Um, might just set that back mine to 30 minutes. So what the idle alarm does, if you don't touch any uh, controls on the radio after 30 minutes, as I've set it at the moment, it'll beep. Um, and the audio is excellent on this radio. It's very loud and very clear. Um, if you put the radio in your little carry case in the back of the car, you can actually hear it quite, quite well, even outside the car. There's an intro video, which here yeah, you play that once, and yeah, it's a bit of a novelty thing. It, it plays at startup, so when you first boot the radio up, it plays like about a 10 second power box core video. Um, yeah, you can have a look at it, but you probably turn it off after you've seen it once or twice. So that's pretty much that in that menu. And the main menu that I wanted to go through is a system menu. Let's have a look in there. So the system menu, quite a few little options in here. Let's start from the top and work our way down. There's the pilot name. Um, obviously that's my name, Costas, so I've got that in there. There's a date and time, which can be set to automatic or manual. Now the core and the Atom have a GPS, an internal GPS. So when you set it to automatic and in, con in conjunction with the location and time zone, it will automatically um, set the correct time for you um, anywhere in the world. The um, radio does um, have a GPS receiver, as I mentioned, and there's a little icon at the moment. It's yellow because I'm inside my metal shed, and my metal garage, and at the moment it's not receiving any satellites. Once you start to receive three or four satellites, this little triangle will start to... Um, flash and indicate a number of satellites once it's got a lock on it'll go solid and you'll see a little number next to it, it might say seven or nine indicating it can see seven or nine satellites etc so that'll vary depending on how many satellites you can see so once you've got a satellite lock um, the time is automatically updated however if you prefer you can set the time to manual so you can set it to whatever time you like the time's important mainly for your log files so obviously if you go flying and it's uh, you know one o'clock in the afternoon and uh, you might have say four or five flights it's nice to have the correct time so if you want to review the log files you have a, a bit better bearing of um, which log file is which there's a 24 hour option so you can also select AM PM so just below that you'll see a number of flags there that's just a language setting so the radio does support a number of languages um, obviously German being a uh, German manufacturer you'd think it'd support German then you've got English UK France etc etc just be aware that the spoken telemetry is impacted by the language so if you select German it'll uh, speak German to you as far as the uh, telemetry is concerned okay we have a metric and imperial setting so this mainly impacts the units that are used for telemetry so if you're using a GPS for instance and you're looking at altitude if you want it to be specified in feet obviously you select Imperial if you want meters you obviously have metric selected and I grew up in the metric system so um, yeah I have it set to metric software check if we go into here so in conjunction with the Wi-Fi, if the Wi-Fi is switched on, this allows you to do your software updates. So at the moment, this particular radio is running version 3.20, which is current at this point in time. If I wanted to update the application, it's just a simple matter of pressing the update button and it'll automatically prompt you and the, you know, the update's done wirelessly. Um, you don't have to muck around with files, loading them onto a USB stick or a... Um, SD card, it's fairly seamless, seems to work pretty well. Um, there's also an option for uh, updating the operating system. Uh, it's a less common update. There was one earlier this year which we had to do and um, again fairly seamless. 
once you're connected with the Wi-Fi, click update and away you go. Uh, the next two items show you the version for the transceiver and stick controller. So normally these are updated, if you do an application update, if these need an update, they're sort of automatically updated. So you should never really have to find yourself in a situation where you need to have to update these individually. We look a little bit further down the list, you'll see there's receiver A, B, C, D. So the core can support up to four independent receiver units. And um, one of the facilities of the Powerbox systems is you can wirelessly update your receivers. So at the moment it's showing just one receiver. I don't have it connected to the radio at this point in time, but if it was, it's just a matter of hitting update with the receiver switched on. And if I wanted to, I can downgrade. I can go back to an earlier software variant. So you see inside the receiver uh, transmitter, there's um, these files that pertain to the receiver. So the transmitter uses those files to update the receiver. Uh, as of today, the current software version is 4.1. Okay, back to the last item, I think, which is firmware recovery. So the bottom item, firmware recovery, that pertains to the receivers. You can get in a situation where you might stuff up the uh, firmware upgrade for a receiver, so you switch it off when it's performing the update. Or somehow you corrupt it um, you'll see notice there's a red light that comes on on the receiver and it will never bind to the radio so one of the options here is to run this firmware recovery option and what that allows you to do is you have just one receiver switched on um, you can actually run this update and it will actually recover the, the, the receiver I haven't had a need to use that at this point in time but some people online have had to do it and seems to work fine. Okay, let's go back. So we've done the software. Now, servo data. Now you'll notice it says PWM. If I click on it, well push it I should say, it goes blank. Push it again, goes back to PWM. So this servo data pertains to the servo socket, three pin servo socket that's on the front panel, underneath the front panel I should say, on the Atom and core radios. So when it's set to PWM, the radio will send out a PWM signal so you can use it as a servo tester. You can also feed it into other systems as well. There's another option when you're using the radio as a trainer, student trainer setup, you can feed an S bus signal back into the radio via that same port. And basically, in that case, um, you could select blank and it allows, it allows you to use that connector as an input. So again, when using it as a trainer, you can attach a, res a receiver that outputs an SBUS signal into that port. And I think from memory, if that's actually working, you'll see SBUS uh, listed on the screen. Okay, fast start option. So fast start, if we switch that on, if we turn the transmitter off, uh, as most people are aware with these radios, they're not instantaneous on boot. So they take a while to boot up, so I think the cores are around about 20 seconds or so, 20-30 seconds, depending on the model. Um, however, if you set fast start to on, what that allows you to do is when you switch it on, after about 5 seconds or so, you can actually control your radio, uh, sorry, your model, with the transmitter. However, the transmitter still keeps booting up, because what it does, it uses the program, the last model that was installed or loaded into memory, it uses that as the base model to allow you to control the model before the screen's actually, or the rest of the CPU is finally booted. Remember there's two CPUs in here, you've got the Linux processor, and then you've got, I think it's a PIC microcontroller which controls your model. So the PIC microcontroller boots up really quick, it's ready to go pretty much you know, after a few seconds after the switch on. And obviously if you load it with the current model, it works. Um, the Linux PC takes a little bit extra to boot up. So that can be handy for some people. I normally don't bother with it, just leave it switched off, but yeah, something to play with. Telemetry logging, um, you can turn it off and on. So if it's off, the radio doesn't do any logging. Uh, leave it on, and what happens is every time the uh, radio is bound to a receiver, so when you switch the model on, it automatically starts logging. So you don't have to stuff around with switches on your radio, 
Uh, you know, you might go into a flight and these radios that need a switch throw and to start logging, you know, sometimes you'll forget. And then you have an incident and then, oh, hang on, I forgot to start the logging. So it becomes useless. So in this particular case, what Powerbox have done is it's just a master on off switch. And normally I just leave it on. The file system automatically manage the files. So after about 30 or so logs, it will automatically delete them. So that's plenty for you know typical days flying. Um, and obviously you can download them onto a USB stick if need be. So again, I just leave that on. That way I never forget to have my logging enabled. Uh, calibration. So that's um, you know your standard stick calibration or switch calibration. You just basically go into the menu, you move the control or function, uh, sorry, the uh, switch or the um, rotary knobs or whatever you can tell it for instance if we swap switches around you can tell it is it a two position switch three position switch we can invert the direction uh, on my radio I invert the switches and um, then you can go into calibration so if you're doing like a rotary dial or a one of your, uh, your sticks for instance if I uh, move my uh, gimbal here you'll notice it's now uh, moved to the uh, sticks C it's telling me it's a linear type of function or control and um, it's in the normal direction and then you are going to calibrate it's pretty pretty much same as most radios you know you move it to the center to the extremes that sort of thing and yeah calibration is done usually that's only really required if you're changing a switch or if for whatever reason you know one of the controls has drifted or whatever but I've never had to really calibrate the radio Okay, what else have we got here? Calibration, export. The export function just basically exports a file um, basically to a USB stick and you can use it for debugging. Not so much for a user, but possibly for Powerbox if there was something wrong with the radio and they wanted that information, you can export it. It's just an XML file from memory or text file. And then obviously a serial number. Okay, that pretty much covers our... Um, settings menu um, yeah that'll probably do for now like I said in future videos I'll uh, I'll cover off pretty much all these other options as well try and keep the videos short not too long I uh, hope you enjoyed this one and um, hopefully I won't take too long to put up the next video thanks for watching